Senator Hinojosa. Uh, will the senator yield for questions? I yield, Senator. Thank you. You know, Senator Schwartner, I, I listen to the exchange uh, between you and um, Senator Nelson. Now, you know, we're making some big changes uh, through uh, House Bill 1927. Uh, I, I, like many people, support the Second Amendment. And, and I think right now that people can own uh, a gun and have a gun at home uh, and also carry concealed carry or with a holster uh, under the concealed handgun carry statute. But you know, you, you, you claim this law does not change who may possess a weapon or as, uh, in public. Could you elaborate on that? The law does not change who may possess a firearm under law, that is correct. It does allow for individuals to avail themselves of their Second Amendment rights to bear arms, carry. Um, and so that is, that is a distinction. And that is actually the purpose of the law, is to diminish an artificial barrier to the right to keep and bear arms. Well, let's talk about that artificial barrier that you continue to uh, talk about. Uh, under current law, uh, there are only two statutes really that govern who may not carry a gun in public. Uh, there's a penal code, section 4604, and then the license to carry government statute uh, 411.172. Would you agree those are the only two that really cover who may possess a gun in public? That's my understanding. Um, you might want to elaborate more. Well, you know, I mean, I, I just want to know because I mean, you're saying that it doesn't change the law. Well, I want to go down the statutes. So people understand exactly what it is that we change in here and what impact it will have on public safety and on increasing the danger to our police officers. Right? Uh, as I understand the section uh, 4604 of the Penal Code, uh, the following people are prohibited from possessing a firearm. Someone convicted of a felony, but only in public, they can keep a firearm at home. Uh, someone convicted of assault against a family member in the last five years, uh, and someone subject to protective order. Are those the three parts of uh, the Penal Code Section 4604? What you just read, I think, is correct, yes. Okay. So, what you're doing now uh, with your... Uh, House Bill 1927, uh, you're allowing people that the statute for to carry a concealed handgun uh, right now will prohibit from carrying a gun in public or even having a gun, issue having a, a license issue. Senator, the bill simply, if you cannot possess a firearm at this time, you will not be able to carry under this bill. This bill removes certain licensure requirements so that individuals that are law-abiding, 25 years age or older, can carry in a holstered manner uh, a sidearm for his personal offense. Well, you know, I'm not worried about the law-abiding citizens. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the ones that are not law-abiding citizens. Uh, and, uh, well, well, we, all are, we all are worried, certainly, of individuals that are not law-abiding. That's why... I have authored this bill is to allow law-abiding citizens to carry. Under the Gun Control Act, federal law, I can list them all for you right off the ATF website. Individuals that have been convicted in any court of a crime punishable by imprisonment for a term of exceeding one year are not allowed to possess and therefore not allowed to carry in the state. Anybody that is a fugitive from justice, anybody that has been adjudicated as a mental, as mentally defect, as a mental defective, or has been committed of any mental institution, who is an illegal alien, who has been disarmably discharged, who has a restraining order. Is committed. that state statute or federal law? That's federal law. Yes. Well, we just passed legislation last week that we didn't want federal law enforced by the state. So, how, how do you, you know, make that compatible? Again, it's federal law. It's against the law. And if you well, cannot possess, you cannot carry. How do you enforce that? We passed legislation last week that says, Senator Hall carried it, that says that we will not work and enforce federal laws that has an impact on guns. So I mean, that's very inconsistent. You enforce every law by prosecution of, a, of an individual violating the law. I, well, you know, I, I disagree with the way you present that because that is not the case, uh, especially when we are not 
uh, allowing state authorities to be able to enforce federal law. But I, I want to go by one, by one by one what your bill, House Bill 1927 does in terms of uh, eligibility to uh, get a license to carry. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you have not been, if you've been convicted of a felony right now, that's the same as the uh, penal code. Is that correct? If you time. have, if you've been convicted of a felony, you're not allowed to own a gun or carry a gun in public. That's right. And that's in the penal code. That is correct. You cannot collect. You cannot. If you're a felon, you cannot possess. You cannot carry. You cannot. Yeah, I'm sorry. You cannot carry. Correct, and, 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 but that's in the penal code. Some of the other provisions that we have for eligibility requirements for a license to carry uh, under a general government code are not in the penal code. That, you're absolutely right, and that's what we're doing with this bill is removing some of those eligibility, of some of those criteria, removing the requirement of a license. That's the whole purpose of the bill, is to restore those fundamental rights and not have in place a state-imposed artificial barrier to permitless carry, i.e. the need to get a permit. Well, uh, as I understand, uh, right now, under the eligibility statute, that you're allowing to people bypass on the House Bill 1927, uh, the eligibility sta statute for someone to qualify to get a license to carry, uh, if they are a fugitive from justice, if they are a fugitive from justice, uh, they, are, they cannot get a license to carry. Is that correct? Under current law, a fugitive from justice is now allowed to uh, obtain a license to carry. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and that's not in penal code. No, that's under, as you said, Government Code 411172, I believe. So uh, I guess uh, then if you're a fugitive uh, under uh, House Bill 1927, you can carry a gun in public. Again, we are reestablishing the foundational principle that if you can possess a firearm, you should be able to carry a firearm. And so the bottom line is that possession requirement is the as, long, as well as your constitutional right as your permit is the foundational principle that we're establishing here under this bill regarding the carrying of a sidearm in public. So a fugitive... So similar, sir, to, well, to basically what we have with long guns. As you, as you are well aware, the possession of a long gun has never been restricted by a license, and individuals that you're describing can carry a long gun in public. Well, we're not talking about long guns. We're talking about well, I'd like to draw the corollary so that people fully understand that it is not a, a huge leap to give an owner of a handgun the same right as an owner of a long gun currently has in Texas. So I guess what you're saying is that if you're a fugitive from justice, you can carry a handgun in public. Again, we're equalizing the rights between owners of handguns and long guns and removing the license to carry provisions that have been imposed by the state of Texas over the years. Well, you explain to me how are you uh, equalizing uh, the rights of a fugitive uh, who is uh, a fugitive from justice uh, as compared to a law-abiding citizen? Again, sir, I, this removes the state-imposed license that has been put in place to carry a sidearm in Texas and equalizes it with those that are currently in place with the carrying of a long gun. Okay, um, so you they, the possession, if you cannot possess, you cannot carry under this bill. And that, I believe, is the correct, along with the amendments that are going to be offered, uh, is the correct vision and steps that need to be taken in Texas to equalize and recalibrate the possession of a sidearm uh, by law-abiding individuals. What are the barriers? This is a great, this is a great discussion. This is, what are the barriers the state should impose when it comes to gun ownership and the carrying of that gun, the bearing of that gun in public? Um, you and I probably have a difference of opinion. I, I've articulated it with the filing of this bill, and I think it is an appropriate bill regarding possession 
and subsequent caring. And, and so um, the removal of the LTC, some of the LTC requirements uh, has been part of this bill. That's the whole premise, again, the premise of the bill. So you are allowing a fugitive from justice equalize that fugitive from justice with a law-abiding citizen. I mean, no, my actually, S- Senator, I, I know you bring out the fugitive of justice, but actually with, under federal law, a fugitive of justice cannot, a fugitive from justice cannot possess. And so therefore, you should not carry in Texas under, under this law as well. So um, they would not be able to carry because, as a fugitive um, under this bill. Well, I know you stated that before, but like I said, you know, well, let me, let me go to another issue on that. Sure. Uh, right now, if you are addicted to drugs, right, you cannot qualify for a license to carry. If you're addicted to drugs, you cannot, you're not eligible for a license to carry, nor are you able to possess a firearm, and therefore you should not be able to possess or carry under this bill. Well, we're not talking about possession, okay? Uh, because there are a lot of loopholes by which a person can get uh, a uh, firearm, uh, as you well know, uh, from gun shows uh, to uh, straw buys to stolen guns, uh, person-to-person sales. So we have all that, mm-hmm. all those loopholes in place. What I'm focusing on, what's in the statute right now, to provide someone, allow someone to get a license to carry a concealed weapon uh, or in public uh, in a holster and show the gun uh, that you're not allowed to do a get a license if you're a drug addict or addicted to drugs. But with House Bill 1927, if somebody's addicted to cocaine uh, and they also happen to have a gun before they got addicted, uh, they will be able to now go public and carry a gun in public? No, sir, that is incorrect. If you are not able to possess a firearm, and one, of the, one under the Gun Control Act, you're, who, an individual who is an unlawful user of, or addicted to any controlled substance, as defined in Section 102 of the Controlled Substance Act codified in USC 21, if you are not, if you are addicted or an unlawful user, and cocaine certainly fits that criteria, you cannot possess, and therefore you cannot carry under this bill. Well, you know, that's a federal law. You know, this, that is not state law. Senator, I, how many laws do we need? That's the whole purpose of this The ones that we can enforce. And, and you I, voted for a law I, and legislation that I we could not enforce federal law dealing with any restrictions on guns yeah. in place by federal law. Yeah. I, I understand okay. your position, sir. I appreciate it very much. The, um, the bottom line is, yes, it is removing a... Um, provisions in current law, Texas current law, government code section 411.172 regarding eligibility to have a license to carry that were put in place, the genesis of them go back to the concealed carry law and the eligibility to have concealed carry. And as you know, at that time, concealed carry was a fairly novel concept, the restoration to carry a sidearm in public. And, And so there were probably provisions put in there that were probably unnecessary and, and somewhat um, over the top to get the bill passed maybe or to, to just see how it does and when you're reinstituting a right. And, and so this is, again, the um, repeal of that statute, the license to carry, and the restoration uh, of the right to carry based upon the Constitution uh, as well as the ability to possess. But right now, you're pretty much taking away a lot of the safeguards we have in place to keep uh, people who uh, do not qualify under the present statute for a license uh, through House Bill 1927. Let me read you some, some of the other provisions that you bypassing with the House Bill 1927. Uh, right now, under the government code for eligibility to get a license, uh, you will not, you're not get a license if you're incapable of exercising sound judgment uh, with respect to the proper use and storage of a handgun. Uh, you cannot get a license if five years preceding to the date of application, you've been convicted of a Class A or Class B misdemeanor. You cannot get a license if you uh, have, not been, have not been finally determined to be delinquent in making child support payments. Uh, you cannot get a license. Uh, 
if there's no determination uh, and under a, a current law, under a court protective order and subject to a restraining order. So, you know, you have all these restrictions on family law violence, uh, Senator Nelson, uh, that you are bypassing under House Bill 1927. The bill repeals the, the sections regarding eligibility to LTC and reestablishes the right to possess as the foundational basis of the right to carry. There are the, one of the amendments does add back certain provisions regarding class A or B provisions that have to do with assaultive, threatening, or weapons-related crimes. Um, I think we've distributed those amendments to the members. I, I hope you have those. But there are provisions regarding individuals that have had a class A or bis, class B misdemeanor conviction um, that re regarding assault, causing bodily injury, deadly conduct, a terrorist threat or disorderly conduct with a firearm. So those are, those are provisions that, that are put back in place or are, are kept in place regarding the ability to carry um, without a permit. You know, I, I, uh, I'll leave the issue alone for now, but I, I want members to really understand that what we are, what safeguards we have in place that are being bypassed by House Bill 1927 uh, and allowing anyone uh, that is prohibited right now under uh, the li uh, license to carry uh, law is in place uh, to bypass that and go ahead and, and be out there even though uh, under the license to carry they would not qualify. That's what this bill does. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and, and we talk about background checks. You, you mentioned that uh, right now, if you try to get a license to carry, you have a background check. Is that not correct? That is correct, yes. If the individual wants to get, to get a license to carry, they do have to have a background check. Well, you know, uh, but now, under House Bill 1927, uh, there will be people who bypassed that back criminal background check. Individuals that are able to, are not able to possess, will not be able to carry legally under this law. It does allow individuals, uh, and when you go and purchase a sidearm, you do have a background check. So there is that parameter as well. But, but you're correct, people will be able to carry permanently without a background check um, if they are not carrying illegally under the uh, various provisions of the federal possession um, statutes. Well, you know, under the um, license to carry statute, uh, Senator Schwarter, uh, there were 2,269 people who were denied a license to carry because they didn't qualify or meet any of the requirements under the license to carry statute. Uh, these people were deemed too dangerous. Now, they can bypass license to carry and go ahead and carry a sidearm out in public under House Bill 1927. Senator, there, you're absolutely correct. There have been individuals that have been denied licenses to carry or had them revoked or suspended. Um, there are varying reasons why DPS does that. Um, the, this does not, though, uh, diminish any obligation of a person that is in one of those categories that cannot carry, uh, cannot possess, they, they cannot carry. So uh, it does not diminish their obligation to fulfill the requirements of being able to carry. The background check is a part of obtaining a firearm at a, um, at a store. And I think that's appropriate and that has not changed in this law at all. But the License requirement is repealed, and part of the license requirement is a background check and weapons. Um, we can talk about all of them if you'd like, but that is, again, the, the whole genesis and reason for the bill is the discussion of what level of, of um, requirement the state wants to impose, what level of, of um, mandates we want to put upon law-abiding citizens to avail themselves of the Second Amendment rights. We've seen historically over the last number of years uh, the uh, effects of concealed carry and open carry, and, and I, I think it is reasonable to trust our citizens and to allow them 
to exercise their good judgment when carrying, knowing if they f- fit or don't fit in a certain um, criteria. They, they, if they, you know, a felon's going to get a gun if they want a gun, unfortunately. But what, what the, the greater good of the bill is, is the ability of a law-abiding citizen to not, to, to be able to feel safe and to carry when they think it is an appropriate measure for themselves. I'm not worried about the law-abiding citizens. You have a lot of the people there that don't qualify under the license to carry statute we have in place. And those requirements, we have there for a purpose. Uh, and that is to protect the general public from having people that should not have a gun who are a danger to the general public and our police uh, not be able to carry out in public or own a gun. Because your bill, um, House Bill 1927, doesn't deal with a criminal background check, does it? It does not. No, it, it's, it repeals for, it does not repeal the statute because you can still get a license, but it repeals for those that wish to carry in a permanent manner that requirement to get a license prior to carrying. Well, and, and one of the, um, I mean, there were also close to a thousand applications that were denied because they were felons. So usually the primary tool that we now have in place under the license to carry statute um, filters out those who are not allowed to carry. A, a felon is not allowed to carry under this bill. They are prohibited from carrying. And, um, well, you know, a felon, a, a felon that wants a gun is probably going to get a gun, unfortunately. And I think it's just as, I think it's vitally important that law abiding citizens that, that need a gun are able to obtain those without the extra hurdles of having to find, go through a licensure process. And so, um, yeah, there, there's, there's bad, and it's interesting that, that, that people that are felons actually try to get a license. You know, it, it makes, me, um, makes me think, why do they even try to get a license, right? Well, but, you know, here's the other issue. You talk about criminal background checks. It's, it's important filter that we have right now on a present statute uh, that we are now allowing all these people to bypass. Uh, and that is, we have uh, loopholes in the present statute. Uh, or in law, uh, in terms of a stranger to drain, a stranger to stranger gun sales. I mean, the people buy and sell guns to each other, uh, not necessarily family, but individuals to one individuals. I mean, there's no criminal background check on those. Uh, we have gun show sales. Uh, where there's no criminal background check either. So those people get guns, uh, and now they'll be able to carry them out in public. Uh, We have um, online gun sales. It's also not addressed in your bill. Uh, We have straw purchases um, that go on all the time. I know it happened a lot in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, We have uh, the Charleston loophole. If you don't get a a response from the federal government on a criminal background check, uh, that means that you can get a gun. Uh, and, uh, and then you talk about stolen guns in your cars. So all those folks there right now under House Bill 1927 will be able to carry a gun in public. Senator, this has changes no laws regarding gun possession or gun transfer um, at all. This is a relatively, uh, the purpose of the bill is a relatively straightforward purpose targeted to removing the licensure requirement to carry a handgun in the state of Texas and make it commensurate and similar to the carrying of a long gun that is currently allowed without the need to obtain a license. Um, Criminals are going to break the law. We know that. They're going to obtain a gun. There are potential problems in our gun laws, but this bill is not about that. This is, again, about allowing law-abiding individuals, 21 years of age or older, carry a holstered sidearm, for their self-defense in public places. That's the purpose of the bill and the focus of the bill. And the requirements that are changed within it are in effect to ease that um, allowance for those law-abiding citizens. Well, and, and that is the problem, uh, Senator Schwarter, uh, is that there's no criminal background check and uh, your bill bypasses uh, the statute that now provides for a background check if you get, if you or to get a license from the state to carry a weapon. Uh, and, and, uh, and let me just, uh, a couple more questions because I think it's important. Uh, right now, under the um, license to carry statute we have in place, uh, there are certain requirements that you have to meet to qualify for a license. Uh, that's a minimum of four hours of in-person handgun safety, one to two hours of range instruction, 
proficiency demonstration, 50 rounds from a three yard line to 50 yard line, and a background check. So under House Bill 1927, we're setting that aside for someone that doesn't want to go through this type of uh, process. The requirement, the state hurdle through a licensure that requires an individual to do X, Y, or Z is what is being set aside. The, the obligation on the part of a citizen that owns a dangerous, uh, potentially dangerous weapon to understand gun laws, to become proficient in their handling of their gun is not absolved. That's a requirement and obligation uh, of being a citizen and, a, and a, a partaking of your right to carry a sidearm. Um, and so what we saw in committee um, that you and I sat through for many, many hours were that in states that passed this type of law, there was actually an increased amount of training that occurred. Um, that was some of the testimony we heard by certain individuals. And that we also heard that in some of those states, there was actually an increase in the number of individuals that um, decided to get a license. They might have never have wanted to or, or really... they. <laughs> They might have never thought it was, it was uh, necessary to get a license. I probably won't be you know, in a bad situation all that often. But then, then they have this opportunity to avail themselves of their Second Amendment rights of self-defense and attain a gun and get trained on it and go, you know, this is, this is kind of neat. I might carry it more often. I probably want to get a license to carry. I might actually purchase another handgun in the future. And I might want to have the ease of being able to do that. So they, get a, they, they actually have an increase of of interest and, and um, um, interest in gun ownership and, and self-protection. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing for our populace in this day and age. Well, and so I, that was the testimony we heard, sir. I, I don't have any issues and problems with self-protection, having a gun at home. But you know, even I, I, I served in Vietnam, the United States Marine Corps, uh, and I was trained on Thank weapons. you for your service, yes. Uh, and and Sergeant Schwarter, some of us got a medal for being a sharpshooter. Some of us got a medal for being just excellent shooter. Right. Uh, some just passed. Uh, so now, without going to a proper training, we're allowing people that possibly couldn't hit the side of a barn to uh, carry a gun in public and start shooting in case there's, uh, something happens. Well, you know, marksmanship, I think weapons proficiency, gun, understanding of gun laws is extremely important. Do you need to be a marksman, a marine, uh, expert rifle tag? Were you an expert or were you one of the other ones? But I'm a nonetheless, shooter. Um, <laughs> you're a sharpshooter. The the um, the need to to you know there's a level of basic proficiency that is a that is a uh, obligation on the part of a citizen exercising their right under the Second Amendment. I don't um, deny that people need to know how to handle their firearm, how to store it safely. They need to know their gun laws, uh, and if you're going to partic participate in a situ in, in this. Uh, expanded right or restored right um, that is something that, that certainly needs to be emphasized um, and so luckily and appropriately we saw that in other states I think that's going to happen in Texas too well uh, I just see the changes you're making creating a huge loophole and pretty much eliminating uh, virtually all the safeguards we have in place under the present statute not only to protect the general public, but to make some kind of criminal background check, but also to allow uh, our police forces to be able to tell uh, who's out there. If you got a gun, they assume you have a license. Uh, now, with this uh, husband, 1927, they don't know if you have a license or not. They don't know if you're a criminal, you're a felon, or it's a protective order. You, you put them there at higher risk uh, under House Bill 1927. And I, I, but I do want to thank you for being patient and answering my questions. We went through a pretty long hearing. Uh, we heard all type of testimony. Uh, but I, I just, um, I truly believe in the Second Amendment right. Uh, people should auto be, have the right to own weapons. But I, I somebody quoted uh, a, the case, uh, a Supreme Court case, I guess the... Um, District, District of Columbia was Heller, uh, and I think it was uh, Senator Hall. And, and I'll end with this, you know, because there's a question and issues about some type of regulation by the state. Uh, there seems to, there seems, this is what the Heller case said, uh, there seems to us no doubt 
on the basis of both text and history that the Second Amendment conferred an individual right to keep and bear arms. Of course, the right was not unlimited, just as the First Amendment's right of free speech was not. Thus, we do not read the Second Amendment to protect the right of citizens to carry arms for any sort of competition, just as we do not read the First Amendment to protect the right of citizens to speak for any purpose. It's an example of a lawful limitation. Justice Scalia uh, states that prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under a Second Amendment right. But thank you so much, Senator Ward. Yes, sir. I, I appreciate you writing that out loud. I was going to read that later. <laughs> thank you very much.